All right. Okay, so uh, epilepsy and anti-epileptic drugs, definitely a specialty area, but I think it's something that's reasonably common, 50 million people worldwide, 2 million Americans. Uh, if you go into neuro, actually one of the first experiences I ever had working with the PA was I shadowed a um, pharmacist that worked in an epilepsy clinic and she was training a new PA. So she talked to both of us at the same time about epilepsy, so that was kind of cool. Uh, but anyway, um, so it's definitely something that number of specialists work in. Uh, a lot of times it's a neurology subspecialty, uh, but certainly um, APPs or APPs and uh, pharmacists and other practitioners can get involved in it too. Again, there's a lot of people out there with epilepsy. It just depends on where you work or if you're interested in it and you want to go for it. There's probably areas that you can practice in if that's something of interest to you. I think it's a kind of a cool subspecialty of neurology personally. It's something I've always been interested in, but I've never really pursued it as a career. Anyway, so uh, relatively not super common, but not a totally uncommon disease. It's something you'll see quite a bit. And uh, a lot of the drugs that we're going to talk about today have uses in other areas of medicine, too, especially if we go into psych. So if you're wondering why I'm spending so much time on epilepsy, which I'm not really, it's only 28 slides. But uh, we'll talk about some of them during bipolar, and we'll talk about some of them for some other psychiatric conditions, too. So they've gotten crossover into a number of other areas of medicine. Uh, treatment response for epilepsy is about 70%, and um, that's assuming optimum therapy, and that could be any type of uh, drug combination, if you want to think about it that way. So that could be monotherapy, two drugs, three drugs, four drugs. So epilepsy is somewhat easy to treat, and about half the patients, about 50%, will respond to a single drug regimen, which is pretty good. But then the other 50%, you can end up with really challenging cases. So, um, like we have a we have a guy in the RICU now with irretractable seizures. Have you heard of Brain on Fire? Anybody watch that? Any chance he kind of has that actually, believe it or not? Um, and it's super rare, but uh, he's on a pentobarbital drip, which I've never seen before. So it's kind of, I mean, it's not good for him, but from an interest perspective, there are some really complicated cases. That's not really epilepsy either, but it's manifests similarly. Um, there's some cultural and global stigma associated with epilepsy. I don't think. I don't think of like um, European culture or United States culture generally having a stigma towards epilepsy like you might say we have a stigma towards mental health patients, but there definitely are cultures where epilepsy is looked down upon differently than, than we would view it. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. 10% um, of people will have a seizure during their lifetime. So seizures actually in and of themselves as an isolated event are quite common. Uh, most of the time they happen for pediatric patients uh, from a high fever, right? That's the most common presentation. That's not epilepsy. That's a, that's a, a provoked seizure of some sort, which is different. Um, an epilepsy would be defined as two or more unprovoked seizures. 60% um, is idiopathic. Uh, I think genetics, perinatal issues, trauma, stroke, infections, cancer could be all be part of the causes behind why somebody might have epilepsy, um, as far as the other ones that are not idiopathic. Highest incidence, very young and very old patients have the highest incidence of presenting with epilepsy for the first time. And it can have a significant lifestyle impact. Depending on how controlled your seizures are, you may or may not be able to drive a car. Um, some jobs you might not be able to work either, just depending on how your seizures affect your day-to-day -day living. All right, what is a seizure? A sudden change in behavior that is a consequence of brain dysfunction. So an epileptic seizure is thought to be electrical hypersynchronization of neuronal networks. I think of overactivity going on in the brain some ways. And it's a good thing to start thinking about that, especially as we move into psych, because we're going to talk about things like bipolar disorder, which I kind of think of manic phases as having a similar um, uh, like electric response where you have some overactivity in certain pathways in the brain, which is why they're treated very similarly. Uh, so anyway, that's a side note. Um, provoked seizures would be metabolic, drug withdrawal or overdose, other acute neurologic disorders. Provoked seizures, epileptic seizure, unprovoked. Uh, you treat them basically the same way. There's not a huge difference there. The only treatment of seizures we really do differently is for preeclamptic seizures, and that's for OB patients. We'll talk about that during the OB section, but we use magnesium sulfate on really high doses for that. Otherwise, all the drugs we're going to talk about today, it really would be used in either or. So, um, Psychogenic non-epileptic seizures are a subtype. Have you guys talked about pseudo-seizures? Okay, so it's a physical resemblance of epileptic seizures, but it's not actually a real seizure. It's some kind of a physical manifestation of an illness. And uh, it's really difficult to uh, pin this down sometimes in people because they'll look like they're having a seizure. A good epileptic I don't know if that's a real word, uh, could probably identify it, but uh, for the most 
especially like a common person, if you were like out at Target and you saw somebody drop to the floor and look like they're having a tonic clonic seizure, if you've never seen one before, or even if you've seen one before, you probably would think, gosh, this guy's probably having a seizure. I should call EMS, which you should. But at the same time, um, you do get we do get patients who come in frequently who have these pseudo seizures and they can be really challenging to uh, treat because they'll get worked up for epilepsy, they get started on anti-epileptic drugs and they don't need them and they want to keep on them because they, they might you know, think they have epilepsy in, in their head when actually there's no um, evidence on an EEG that they're actually having any seizure activity. Oh, I don't know anything about this, so I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> EEGs are not my realm of, of expertise, but I do know it looks different when you're having a seizure than when you're not, so there we go. <laughs> All right, uh, classification of seizures. So you've got two different types. You've got general and partial. Uh, so general, I think about, is, is involving multiple areas of the brain all kind of going at once. You have uh, the, the big, you think of tonic-clonic seizures, generalized seizure, that's what you're talking about. So movement disorders. Um, partial seizures can really present differently depending on how the person uh, manifests a partial seizure. So it could be anything from just maybe a subtle pass out. I worked with a, a pharmacy tech actually when I was in high school and she got partial seizures actually all the time at work, which is not that's a whole other topic that, to be discussed if you're curious, but um, the, she would just kind of collapse on, on the desk and it looked like almost she was like resting her head, resting her head in her hands. And then, you know, we wouldn't really notice sometimes. And then you'd hear her like getting in an argument with a customer because she would just be like somebody would come up and ask her a question and she'd basically yell back at them, what repeatedly or like, what do you like, hi, or, you know, she'd just say nonsense to them. And then you'd be like, oh yeah, she's post ictal now. And, yep, Bonnie had a seizure again. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, lots of other issues involving that that I won't get into at this time, but that was one of my experiences personally with partial seizures. So yeah, they can they can manifest all different ways, uh, and certainly not necessarily less severe, right? We think of tonic clonic as yeah, you you have the muscle rigidity and thrashing potentially you could injure your head, fall over, and the, the the risk of injury is probably higher. But like a partial seizure, what if you did that while you're driving a car or doing something, you know, with required some some motor skills or focus, then you could end up with a severe impact on somebody else or yourself potentially. So certainly both are important to treat. It's just a stats on it's really old, but I, I don't think it's changed a whole lot as far as the general population, what we see. So general tonic clonic are pretty common with the subtype, but partial seizures as a whole are the more common type of seizures you'll see. Uh, and I'm not going to test you on this or go through this, but just in case you're curious, and I don't know how much you talked about this in other classes, but I think it's kind of interesting to read like what people experience with seizures and how much time is involved in the different phases, what's a postictal phase like, what's um, responsible for different types of uh, so partial seizures versus generalized seizures and the different symptoms people experience. All right, anyway, let's get to the drugs. All right, so anti-epileptic drugs, as you might expect, work on pathways in the brain that prevent excitatory stimuli. So what happens is, is that, like we talked about, you have an excess amount of electronic stimulation going on in the brain. So the electric pathways in the brain are overexcited. And if we can work on specific channels to, to slow down some of those excitatory pathways, we can theoretically prevent seizures. And that's pretty much the mechanism of action of every anti-epileptic drug on the market. They just all work slightly differently and maybe sometimes on different subtypes. So from a mechanism of action standpoint, it's pretty easy to remember them. Now, it gets a little confusing, I think, because we mix and match anti-epileptic drugs, which is, this is probably one of the only diseases where you could combine two drugs that work pretty much on the same channel and get actually a benefit from it. It's really interesting. And why that is, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, somebody who's a neurologist probably knows a lot more about that than me. But this is how they're grouped up for the most part. So I think of the vast majority of anti-epileptic drugs working as sodium channel blockers, just as a general mechanism of action. So what they're going to do is block uh, these ligand gated voltage uh, sodium channels from opening and preventing depolarization and vesicle release of glutamate. Glutamate is a uh, one of many probably excitatory transmitters and so if that process gets stopped you don't release as much glutamate in certain parts of the brain therefore you can't have a seizure. Um, and it's not like we want to shut all that down completely but the idea is to shut enough of it down where you don't get that hyper response in certain areas of the brain where people who have epilepsy seem to have this process overly uh, expressed. Uh, so you can see most of the drugs, we'll talk about them individually, but the vast majority of medications that are common work here. Um, Levetiracetam is Keppra, and that one works a little bit differently. So it's it's common one that's basically going to be part of any anti-epileptic drug cocktail you're going to see, whether it's first line or second line. That's a really popular choice. 
like I see topiramate, uh, another somewhat popular choice, has some issues with it side effect wise, talk about, but that has a different mechanism. Thalamate's not as common, it's a little bit of a newer agent, but it's still, again, I work, we have a pretty decent sized epilepsy unit at Abbott, so I do see probably some more of the rare drugs, so I don't, I don't want to say it's common, because I don't think it is, but it is one that does have a different mechanism. And then we'll talk about gabapentin and pregabalin quickly, because they were developed as anti-epileptic drugs, and they kind of work in the same area, in the same um, neuronal system, but they don't really have actually great anti-epileptic properties. Um, sometimes they do in certain patient subtypes, but for the most part, uh, they're used in a lot of other conditions like neuropathic pain and things like that. Uh, this slide just shows another set of uh, receptors mostly involving the glutamate transmission, and some drugs will work to block uh, different um, responses to glutamate being converted to GABA. We'll talk about GABA here in a, in a little bit, um, but then how it reacts to uh, different chloride channels on the postsynaptic neuron. And you can see some of them work in both places. So, like, uh, and this is inhibitory. So that's the big difference between these two slides. So this is talking about the excitatory synapse, and this is inhibitory synapse. So the idea is when you're working on an inhibitory synapse, you're potentiating the, the mechanism of this. So GABA as, an, as a mediator, which is it's gamma aminobutyric acid, which doesn't mean much to you and doesn't mean much to me either, so we can just call it GABA. Um, so GABA is going to uh, work with these postsynaptic neurons to cause inhibitory responses. So for example, um, like benzodiazepines like Xanax or Ativan or all those drugs, this is what they do. They work on a receptor uh, like this on the postsynaptic neuron, and they basically help them open up, and what they do is they potentiate the effects of GABA. So what you get is an improved inhibitory response in the brain. Now, that can have negative consequences, like it can make you sleepy, it can make you disinhibited, and make you not remember things. So certainly there's problems with that, but for the most part, that's the more focused mechanism of some of these drugs. So a drug like topiramate um, and zanisamide, you can see, actually have activity on both um, areas. So you're thinking about some of these drugs, like for example, zonisamide is a, uh, no, zonagrant's not a controlled substance, never mind. Benzodiazepines and barbiturates, for example, are controlled substances. They work on this and people get a little bit loopy on them and get a little bit of a euphoric response, which is why they're controlled substances. As you're probably well aware, uh, Xanax and drugs like it are quite frequently abused. All right, uh, so let's talk about the different drugs. I kind of ordered these in the way I like them, or broad spectrum to less broad spectrum, common, not common. You know, with epilepsy, there's a lot of different opinions out there on where to start people. I'm going to base my lecture here on what I see done um, by our neurologists and our epilepsy groups, and like if I was a patient, what I would want to be treated with. So um, Keppra is uh, a nice choice for a lot of patients. It's a broad spectrum anti-epileptic drug. It was originally approved just for partial seizures, but it has so much evidence for other areas. You can actually use it IV to stop a tonic-clonic seizure um, in addition to other medications. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more during emergency medicine. So I don't want to get too off the, off the wagon with that. But um, just so you know, like it does come PO and IV. And anytime you have a an anti-epileptic drug that comes in both forms, that's a huge advantage because let's say your patient comes in because they missed their dose of Keppra and they're having a seizure, you can give them an IV bolus of it immediately. It's going to work essentially almost instantly, whereas some other drugs, if they miss multiple doses of it, there's not really a way to get them back up to it or you have to give them an oral dose and then you're looking at you know a few hours before it's going to kick in at the best. So having something IV is a huge advantage in this patient population. And it has other advantages, too, like you can stop a seizure with it uh, that's actually actively going on, even if the patient is on Keppra. Um, okay, so it doesn't have any drug interactions, which is a, a really interesting and unique part of Keppra that uh, doesn't really apply to any of the other drugs we're going to talk about. Basically, all the other ones have a lot of different drug interactions, and you can get really complicated. If you, in fact, if you look up like dosing for some of the other ones we're going to talk about, it'll say, if you're on these anti-epileptic drugs, start this dose. 20% less or started at this dose. So there's a lot of recommendations based on what you're on because so many of them interfere with each, with each other. Keppra is one of the ones that doesn't. So that's why another, a lot of people like to start people on Keppra and like to keep people on Keppra or add Keppra as an adjunct because you don't really have to think about it when you do it as far as just going with the standard dose. You don't really have to dose adjust it with the exception of renal failure. It uh, doesn't really have a lot of side effects. does have some that we'll talk about here in a second uh, under the cons, um, but most people tolerate Keppra pretty well. Um, cons would be it's twice daily dosing. There is an XR, or extended release formulation of Keppra that's brand name, and it uh, would actually I think it's kind of generic now, but um, it's still kind of expensive. So you could do once a day Keppra dosing with that. It is renally eliminated, so people with renal dysfunction have issues potentially. And then uh, the big side effect with Keppra are behavioral, 
behavioral related side effects, so anger, aggression, irritability. Uh, for kids who are being medicated with Keppra, they might see uh, increased like biting and hitting and things like that. With adults, you might just see more uh, psychiatric like symptoms, so even things like depression and, and uh, something like that that might seem not necessarily related to the Keppra, but it's a good thing to think about if you know somebody just started Keppra. Uh, sedation. Uh, it does cause some sedation. It's recommended to titrate Keppra slow, but actually, I probably should have put an advantage in Keppra. You can start Keppra at a decently high dose and get a person to therapeutic dosing on Keppra very quickly, like within a couple of days. Uh, and we're going to con contrast that to lamotrigine on the next slide, which takes weeks to get to therapeutic because it's really dangerous if you start at a high dose. So it says slow titration. And that's really the only reason I put that is if you start your patient on a dose of Keppra and they are getting a lot of sedation, back off and go a little bit slower. But for the majority of patients, you can follow whatever the monogram is going to say. And you can get Keppra dosing up pretty quickly. And like I said, if somebody comes in having a seizure, we can give them a big bolus of Keppra right away and continue that dose with really minimal impact. And eventually, they're going to get used to it. Yeah, they might be a little bit sedated right away, but we can work around that. So uh, again, Keppra, a lot of advantages. Uh, really good drug that is used pretty much um, all over the place within uh, neurology and epilepsy. So we like it a lot for people who are like post-stroke who might have seizures because of that. Um, people who have had head uh, bleeds who are in our ICUs, a lot of times they use Keppra prophylactically that way. So it's a really common medication for across a lot of different disciplines, which is why I put it as the number one. Uh, number two, lamotrigine. Uh, lamotrigine or lamictal is another nice, uh, well-tolerated broad-spectrum anti-epileptic drug. Very well tolerated. Doesn't really have a ton of side effects. The big one is I'm going to talk about it in slow titration here, but uh, really um, probably a bit better tolerated than Keppra when you take into consideration the behavioral effects. It's once daily dose. Half life is about 25 to 33 hours. Sometimes you'll see people splitting it up, like taking it morning at night. Just might be because they might feel a little sleepy on it. Potentially, it does cause some sedation, especially at higher doses. But usually, people don't get that experience with it. Um, it's not really adjusted, uh, so that's nice. But you could. It potentially might be cautious if somebody has really bad kidney function. Uh, and it is considered by a lot of people to be the drug of choice in pregnancy. So Kep uh, Keppra, by the way, is also considered to be somewhat of a drug of choice in pregnancy. But lamotrigine had a lot of um, good retrospective analysis for people who took it that it really has minimal impact on developing fetus. So if you have a woman of childbearing age who's on lamotrigine, uh, it's a good drug to be on. You don't really have to stop it during pregnancy or change anything about it. Uh, big con with lamotrigine, it's got a really slow titration. It takes two months to get to a target dose. The reason is it causes a, a rash in a lot of patients and severely Stevens-Johnson syndrome in a smaller group of patients. So you guys have talked about Stevens-Johnson at some point. I think I might have mentioned it before too. Uh, so skin sloughing, basically it's like massive burns all over your whole body. It's fatal in like a high percentage of patients that get it. Uh, so anyway, the point is, is that to be careful with this and to avoid that really, really rare side effect, we titrate it slowly. So people take like the target dose of homotrogen, I think is like 200 milligrams a day or something like that to start with. So people take like 25 milligrams and they up it by 25 every week and then maybe you can go from like 100 to 200 at some point. But it's really slow. And where that comes into play is for non-adherent patients who miss like a whole week of medication. You have to retitrate them all over again. So the big question comes into play, what do you do in the meantime? Now if they're taking it for seizures, you want something else on board. So that's where somebody will often get something IV, like they get an IV dose of Keppra to hopefully like bridge them until you can get their lamotrigine back on track. Or they might get Velcroic acid, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Those are the two IV options. As you'll see here, lamotrigine does not come IV, so that's another disadvantage of using it. Um, again, very, very good drug, very uh, well-tolerated medication, just has some, some start, start issues with it. Once you get it going and your patient stays on it, though, it's, it's quite handy for a lot of people. Um, the drug interaction, so kept, uh, lamotrigine, excuse me, doesn't have a lot of uh, known cytochrome P450 enzyme interactions. However, if you read its manufacturer recommendations, they'll tell you to change the dose based on what the patient's on. So if they're on Velcroic acid, it says to lower the dose requirement. If they're on a specific enzyme inducer, a good example would be like phenytoin, which we'll talk about here in a few slides, um, you need a dose increase. So it does seem to have some liver metabolism, but maybe just not a traditional pathway. So we don't know for sure what the deal is with that, but um, it, does, it is prone to drug interaction. So even though it might not say cytochrome P450 metabolize, it still seems to be affected by that. Uh, other side effects, mostly dose related. At high doses, you can see um, things like tremor, dizziness, involuntary movement, sometimes insomnia or ataxia too. But that's again, usually have to push the dose pretty high to start seeing that type of stuff. Uh, 
Uh, valproic acid has probably been historically one of the gold standards for epileptic management, especially if you consider it as like a newer generation medication, even though it's been around for quite a while. Uh, valproic acid and divalproic are basically the same thing. They're slightly different salt forms. Uh, divalproic, I should say, is a different salt form of valproic acid. Um, so you might hear it called VPA or valproic acid. It's all the same thing. Uh, Depakote's the brand name of divalproic, which is the oral form. But valproic acid comes as an IV form. It also comes as an oral liquid and a couple other things, too. They're essentially interchangeable, dose to dose. So if you have somebody who's on divalproex once a day and they come in and you need to give them an IV dose, you can pretty much just give them the same amount they would be getting uh, total daily dose. So it's it's mostly a one-to-one. -one. There's a little few caveats there that I'm not going to go into because it gets complicated, but that's the nice thing. So don't think that valproic acid and divalproex are, are totally different. They're pretty much the same uh, potency. That's what I'm trying to get at with this uh, this tangent I'm going on. Uh, okay, so pros with valproic acid. Uh, again, consider it to be more effective than others, but than other options by some people. However, this isn't really well proven. There are some studies that, again, show that it might be slightly more effective than some of the other anti epileptic drugs in the market. Again, it has an IV form available, which is brand name Depakon. Again, it's IV valproic acid. Uh, it doesn't require renal adjustment. It has an extended release product that can be dosed once a day. It also has a delayed release product that can be dosed twice a day, which people mix up all the time. So if you're prescribing Depakote, make sure you're doing the right one. It's really easy to mess it up. Um, okay, cons, contraindicated pregnancy. So the first two drugs, okay in pregnancy, and we'll, we'll review pregnancy here in a second. Uh, but this one is contraindicated, 1 to 2% chance of spina bifida, uh, supplement with folic acid uh, if you do get it, uh, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, enzyme inhibitor, highly protein bound, drug interactions are uh, highly uh, prevalent with this medication. And this is one of the ones, if you look up how to dose it, you'll see what else is your patient on. If you're just starting somebody out on it, it's not a big deal if they aren't on a lot of other medications. But uh, this is one just to keep an eye out for drug interactions for sure, because there's a lot of things that affect its metabolism. And anti-epileptic drugs are one of those slightly more sensitive categories of drugs, where if you get a little bit too high, you can have see more side effects. I think their therapeutic index indices are more narrow than the average group of medications. So we do more blood monitoring concentrations like uh, to see if the person's you know, within a certain range in some cases. Uh, but in a lot of cases, we really want to be careful with those drug interactions. I think AEDs, you just pay more attention to that than you do in some other areas of medicine. Um, enzyme inhibitor, it's high, all right, talk about that. Uh, side effect profile, uh, tremor, alopecia, which is a big problem for a lot of people. Both men and women start losing your hair. Uh, weight gain, another thing that people don't like. Thrombocytopenia, some blood dyscrasis, so CDC monitoring, you start as usually indicated. Uh, irregular men season women. Uh, side effect profile is not great with this drug compared to the first two we talked about. Lamotrigine, Lamictal, sorry, that's the same thing. Levetiracetam, Lamotrigine, both have <laughs> the same. Uh, pretty much well tolerated view. I mean, yeah, you have some differences here and there, but they're a lot better tolerated than valproic acid, which is why, in my opinion, even though valproic acid is thought to be highly effective and certainly it'd be part of a lot of people's anti-epileptic drug regimens, it's not like you can't use it, I would start with something else just because your patient, if they start losing their hair, or how many of them are going to want to keep taking the drug? Uh, if they gain a lot of weight, how many of them are going to want to keep taking the drug? Those are always things to think about. Um, it is hepatotoxic and overdose, so if you have a patient who is uh, maybe potentially suicidal, but probably not a great choice for them. You can reverse it with a product called levocarnitine, but it's a little bit tricky. Uh, monitoring um, LFTs, uh, so liver enzymes, uh, ammonia levels, CBC, those are usually the things you want to get baselines on to make sure that you aren't seeing any liver toxicity. Again, liver toxicity should only really be seen if somebody takes a ton of it, so probably not as big of a deal to monitor this regularly, but usually you're going to get at least a CBC during the initiation phase a couple of times. Uh, topiramate or Topamax is another broad spectrum agent. It's got some maybe, out of the four we've talked about so far, I'd say this is probably like the weakest as far as evidence goes. Doesn't mean it's ineffective, it still is quite effective, but it's just maybe doesn't have the best evidence when compared. Problem is, there's so many anti epileptic drugs out there, and there's no trial that can possibly compare every drug. So a lot of times they're looking at retrospective analysis about seizure activity versus medications. A lot of people are on multiple meds, so there's lots of confounding variables. So evidence in epilepsy is tricky for those reasons. Uh, but uh, as from what we know, a topiramate seems to be like slightly a step down as far as efficacy goes, but still uh, a useful medication. Um, pros, some people may lose weight on this. So if somebody wants to lose weight, uh, that might be an advantage. If they don't, that could be a con, of course. Um, con, uh, people call this drug Dopamax as a joke. So it makes you kind of feel dopey. If we go back to our, 
slide here. Um, I remember topiramate works kind of in the same way that benzodiazepines do, albeit on a much weaker scale. It's not a controlled substance, but uh, people do get kind of sleepy and tired and it's psychomotor slow, or um, yeah, not psychomotor slow, um, like speech slowing, things like that. The speech difficulty, slow thinking, that's what it's trying to say. Uh, up to 30% of patients will experience some variant of that, so that, that's not going to be ideal for a lot of people. So that's a big, big uh, issue with it. It's renally adjusted. It has um, SIP interactions to consider. It's twice daily dose for most patients, and here's some other side effects with it. Really the big one I want you to remember is the slow thinking speech difficulty. The rest of the stuff, you know, sedation would be kind of come hand in hand with that too. Yeah? How long will side effects last for the slow thinking? Potentially, they might get used to it after a while. Um, you could give it a couple of weeks, probably, to see what happens. Um, and ultimately, if you get to a target dose and it's getting worse, you probably want to. If it's really interfering with their job or daily living, you probably want to switch to something else. Yeah, you never know how how a patient's going to respond to it overall. And certainly, they could overcome the side effect, but it's difficult to say. All right, phenytoin, dilantin, kind of moving into older anti-epileptic drugs. This one uh, was, for quite a while, one of the most popular anti-epileptic drugs on the market. It's a broad-spectrum, older medication, um, and also highly, highly effective. Um, it's an IV uh, available to as phosphenytoin uh, called Cerebix. This is the brand name. If you're ever dosing phosphenytoin versus phenytoin, phosphenytoin is dosed in terms of phenytoin equivalents, so the dose is the same, even though it's not technically the same medication. It's kind of a weird one that does it that way. And I'll talk about that more when you talk about critical care and emergency medicine this summer. I'll come back to that briefly. Uh, anyway, cons, very narrow therapeutic index. You have to monitor this one very carefully. Uh, free versus total levels is really important. It's highly protein bound, so if you have other things competing for binding sites on albumin, like valproic acid, or warfarin or any number of other drugs potentially. Uh, it's highly prone to that. And if you start bumping stuff off the albumin, the free levels can increase really quickly. And this has interesting kinetics too because it will increase, uh, I actually think I have a slide on that, so I don't want to get too far. Well, maybe I don't. Anyway, uh, phenytoin will increase non-linearly, so it's actually an exponential growth curve. The more you take, the higher your level. Like if you double your dose, your concentration normally doubles for most medications in the blood. Uh, for phenytoin, it's like double the dose, quadruple or quintuple or whatever you want to say to the concentration. So it goes up really quickly. And a lot of that's theoretical because the, um, well not theoretical, it actually happens, but the theory behind that is because of this highly protein bond. So you're maxing out the, the ability of the drug to bind to albumin and then you get these really high free levels and all of a sudden your, your patient's toxic on it. So what happens if you get toxic on phenytoin and just in general, um, nystagmus, slurred speech, ataxia, common, uh, dizziness, drowsiness, long term you can see um, uh, a couple of things that I don't really care you remember. Um, some of the other things that are maybe people might report are hirsutism, so hair growth in areas that don't want it, uh, gingival hypertrophy, uh, and it's teratogenic as well. So there's a lot of reasons not to use phenytoin, but you will see people on it. It's a, again, it's a relatively effective medication, and if you manage its therapeutic index correctly and get your blood levels and get your patient on a steady dose of it, it's not too bad. You just want to make sure that any changes in medications, especially, uh, that you um, maybe do some blood level, especially if you think there's going to be a drug interaction to watch out for. Carbamazepine is Tegretol, and oxcarbazepine is Triloptol. They're both broad-spectrum anti-epileptic drugs. Carbamazepine is an older medication, oxcarbazepine thought to be better tolerated. It's newer. Uh, they're kind of interchangeable, but kind of not. And it, the side effect profiles are, are somewhat shared, but not quite. So basically, they all cause rash, hyponatremia, uh, drowsiness, blurred vision, and some other things. Uh, Tegretol only has more of an agranulocytosis risk. It's also category D in pregnancy. However, there is some evidence that it might be actually safe in pregnancy, so we don't really know. I'll talk about that later here. Um, SIP inducer uh, induces its own metabolism, which is kind of interesting. So the more you take it, the higher you have to push the dose because it starts metabolizing itself because it induces the enzyme that it's responsible for its breakdown. Uh, both are dosed two to four times daily, but they have lots of extended release formulations, so you can give it more uh, less frequently if you want to. Triloptol is renally eliminated, and uh, you can actually exacerbate absence seizures with this, which are a very rare, odd type of seizure that I don't care you remember or know. But uh, that's one of the one of the side effects or one of the issues with it. Ultimately, these drugs are pretty well tolerated. 
Um, I see, I guess I generally probably see trileptal used more for epilepsy, and carbamazepine has gotten some more use in things like bipolar and neuropathic pain. Some areas like that, they see some crossover with that medication specifically. Other drugs. There's a lot of other ones, and this isn't an exhaustive list. There's probably a few I've missed. Um, though I don't really want you to know any of these drugs. If you, we're going to talk about phenobarbital and benzos during a seven that's hypnotic lecture during psych, so we'll come back to those. Uh, Zonagran or Zonisamide, it's probably the most common one used on here, so it's probably the only one I would say is worth knowing. Um, the rest of them, I'd just be aware that they are AEDs, but other than that, I don't care. Uh, and I don't really care you know anything about Zonagran other than this broad spectrum. Um, it is uh, has some pretty decent tolerability. There are some mild side effects there. All right. Questions on broad spectrum anti-epileptic drugs? Anything we talked about so far? Quickly, um, partial seizures only. There's a couple medications out there that are only approved for partial seizures. Lacosamide is Vimpat. It's an IV formulated controlled substance medication. So it does come orally too, but uh, it's another one that has both forms available. So that's a nice advantage to it. Um, it's got a lot of uh, interesting potential, I think. And I think we're seeing more of it being used. It's controlled substances uh, status hamstrings it a bit. But it's, a, it's an option that we see. There's some even studies with IV formulation to stop a uh, status epileptic type situation. So we're again seeing more play. I don't think it's only for partial seizures quite as much, but it's only approved for partial seizures. So you might see this if you go into this area, get more play in, in, as a broad spectrum agent in general. That's how the vast majority of anti-epileptic drugs get approved anyway. They get approved for partial, and then they get studied later in general patients to see if they work. Um, Teagabine. The gabatrin, ruthenamide, don't really care, you know, any of those. They're all kind of oddballs. They don't um, stick out to me in any way, so I won't test you on them. Just know that they're anti epileptic drugs. That's it. Uh, monitoring levels. So usually when we monitor anti epileptic drug levels, we're looking at trough levels only. And it depends on the type of medication you get. For most of the newer agents, and most of the agents on the market we're, we're looking at today, so that would be um, the Lotrogene, Zalproic Acid, I don't even know. I think you can do a Kepra level, but it doesn't really tell you much. But the point is that you really only do it for compliance. So if somebody comes in and they're having a seizure, you can draw a Kepra level or a Lamotrigine level, see if there's anything in their system. Uh, where it comes back doesn't really matter. Some people will be like, oh, their Lamotrigine level looks kind of low. And it's like, well, the therapeutic range is like 2 to 500. I don't know what that means. And no one really does. Uh, so there's no standard as far as dosing them to a certain targeted level. This doesn't really matter. Uh, as long as they're, you, you follow their symptom improvement. But again, the, the, the idea is that you can check if they're adherent or not on the medication that way fairly easily. Uh, the only <clears throat> other drug that I think is commonly done with levels is phenytoin. This is the phenytoin concentration curve I was talking about here. Um, you can check for toxicity, you can check for compliance with it, but you will usually do levels on a patient with phenytoin in the initiation phases to make sure you're getting the, the right target there. There's a specific goal range in mind with phenytoin, but I don't care you know. All right, really quickly, uh, gabapentin and pregabalin. So these drugs are, gabapentin is probably one of the most popular drugs out there. It seems like they prescribe it for almost everything nowadays, except for epilepsy. So that's why I don't really want to spend too much time on it. Um, both agents are pretty much interchangeable. The big difference right now, uh, in my opinion, is that pregabalin is controlled substance. It's like a C5, so it's the really lowest tier you can get. Gabapentin is not. However, there's been rumors for years that gabapentin will be going controlled. And uh, I actually heard my, one of our pharmacists at work is on the board of pharmacy, and he said that's probably going to be really likely. Where it's been a rumor that everyone's been like, oh, it's not going to happen. The annoying thing is, is that you take a really popular drug and put a controlled substance label on it and it slaps a bunch of regulations around how you can dispense it, how you can prepare it, where you can store it. So it makes everyone's head hurt a little bit thinking about that. So hopefully we've got a little bit more time, but we'll see what happens with that. Again, I've heard that for multiple years in a row and it's never happened, so maybe it won't. I don't know why people would abuse gabapentin, but apparently it, it's something that does happen. I don't get it personally. Uh, all right, both agents, again, somewhat effective as adjunct therapy. There's actually some uh, recommendations. I was doing a continuing education thing that talked about using these drugs specifically in elderly patients who have partial seizures, so new onset partial seizures in the elderly. Uh, there is some evidence that they can be effective, and they're, they're very well tolerated. There's virtually no side effects, not really any monitoring. They have very wide therapeutic indexes, indices, I should say. So there's not really a reason um, to not use them. 
and they probably have better tolerability overall compared to some of the ones we just talked about. In those patient populations, especially elderly, tend to be a little more sensitive to things. So consider them potentially for that patient group. Otherwise, we don't really use them um, for epilepsy. Some patients might be on them as an adjunct, but I would it would be very rare to see it as a primary agent to treat epilepsy, one of these medications, uh, for, the, for the average epileptic patient. Uh, they're mostly used for other things, so neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia, diabetic. We're going to talk about fibromyalgia on the next set of slides quick. Any type of neuropathic pain, that's where they've gotten actually a lot of extra use. Um, why that mechanism works, I don't entirely know. Um, your guess is probably as good as mine. But a lot of times they figure this out because people start taking it and they have the, the condition that, hey, this is helping with this, and then somebody gets wind of it, they study it, and they start prescribing it for that way. And the drug company might file a patent for it, or file with FDA for an approval for that. Um, other types of pain, restless leg syndrome, anxiety. This is a these drugs are really popular in psychiatric patients for anxiety, or at least they were, maybe not so much anymore with the whole thing of people abusing them. Uh, but uh, for a while, gabapentin was pretty much prescribed to everyone as a benzodiazepine alternative. So it's like, we don't really want to give you Ativan because you have a history of, or Xanax because you have a history of abuse. And those drugs are highly likely to be abused. So we'll give you gabapentin because it doesn't have a controlled status and we don't think people abuse it. And you can take it as needed for anxiety or schedule. And it seems to help people with that. Um, and a lot of other psych conditions will have it as an adjunct here and there too. So again, kind of a, a ubiquitous medication in that population. Uh, Anyway, both are pretty well tolerated. Really the only side effect I would say is sedation uh, when you start somebody on a high dose of it. If you titrate it in gently, you can probably avoid that to begin with. I think that um, the dose range, I don't have that on the slide, but the dose range is massive. So for gabapentin, you might see somebody on 100 milligrams TID, which is like kind of a common starting dose for a lot of things. But I've seen people on like 1200 QID, so that's obviously a huge, and that guy was a really big guy, but still, it's a ton of gabapentin to take and like be walking. I don't know. It shows you how, how well tolerated it is. Whether he was getting effects from that much gabapentin, I don't know. I think there'd be some sort of ceiling effect at some point, but that's beyond my knowledge. All right. Uh, newish drugs. I'm not going to test you on these drugs just because when new anti-epileptic drugs come out, it's always like, where are they going to fit in? Uh, so I don't really care you know them. Again, other than just to know that these are anti-epileptic drugs. I think that's an important thing to be able to recognize when you're reviewing a patient or um, looking at medication lists or things like that. Uh, so s list carbazepine, as you might have guessed, is kind of identical to oxcarbazepine, but it's slightly differently formulated to have a more blunted peak effect. So it's almost got like an extended release mechanism built into the way the molecule gets um, metabolized. So you don't necessarily have an, have an extended release product. I don't know. We have it. I've seen it prescribed a couple times. Riviact is probably the one I see most often. Uh, it's uh, rivaracetam, which sounds a lot like levetiracetam, right? So it's a Keppra analog. It's supposed to be more potent than Keppra. So the idea is if you have somebody on a high dose of Keppra, they aren't doing well, or maybe they're having psych side effects or something like that, but they're getting good seizure control, you could maybe try switching them to this. It is a controlled substance, which I don't have here, uh, but that does limit its use. So again, a lot of these newer anti-epileptic drugs are actually controlled substances. Clobazam is, Bicampa is. I think Aptium is, but I'm not 100% sure. Don't quote me on that. But it's funny. I think if all, like Keppra and maybe even Lamotrigine went through trials a while ago, they might have ended up with some sort of uh, minor labeling like that. So it's kind of funny to see how things change that way. Um, the rest of them, Clobazam is kind of like a long-acting benzodiazepine. It just in general, since we're talking about seizures, um, very briefly, benzodiazepines are kind of the gold standard to stop seizures in the acute phase. So um, we give injectable benzodiazepines, which would be like lorazepam or diazepam, Ativan, Valium, brand names. Uh, and so they do work quite well to stop seizures. Problem is they're addictive and people build up a tolerance to them. So long-term use is very frowned upon. So sometimes people will come out with these kind of like benzo analogs that are slightly less likely to cause a peak effect. Think about like, I think about like methadone and opioids, right? Methadone shouldn't really get people high if they take it correctly. And this drug's kind of the same way, but it still provides that same effect, if that makes sense. All right. Let's talk about how we put some of this together. Uh, we'll finish this set of slides and then we'll take a break. Uh, so you've got a couple different options. So this is for a generalized seizure patient. Uh, so initial monotherapy, base choice on broad spectrum plus good side effect profile. So I think most people would agree with me that lamotrigine and levetiracetam are your two first choices you're going to try in most patients. The question is, um, how aggressive do you want to be at the start? And you could certainly use Keppra to bridge somebody to a lamotrigine. If you think that's going to be the better drug for them overall, 
um, it's something that could be done. Or you could start them on Keppra and maybe they start to get some of those side effects where you're like, we really need to control your seizures, so let's keep it going until the lamotrigine, we can get it up. But remember that lamotrigine takes a while to get therapeutic. Not to say you don't get any benefit from it immediately, you probably do, but still to get maximum benefit from it, you want to make sure you get to that dose uh, appropriately, but still titrate it on the schedule as aggressively as you can. Um, Divalprox, topiramate, zanisamide are all kind of second options, I think, um, but I wouldn't really recommend any of them as a first-line agent for somebody, unless you had a really good reason. Um, sometimes people bring up Keppra and, you know, if you have a patient with a psychiatric history, can you still prescribe it? Generally, I think the consensus is yes. I would be careful, though, and monitor for it. It depends on how volatile their psychiatric history is, too. If you have somebody who is, has depression, definitely not a contraindication to, um, to Keppra. Um, but it just, again, it depends on what's going on in the patient. Uh, drug fully titrated, not effective, cross taper to another broad spectrum AED. So you could say, all right, we got you up to your, we're on your, like the max dose of Keppra, it just doesn't seem to be working. Let's start keeping, let's start Lamotrigine and we'll work down the Keppra slowly. And that's a cross taper, right? You're starting something at a low dose while you're decreasing the other thing. It's really common in this type of uh, medicine and also in psychiatric medicine. So we'll talk about that there as well. Uh, the goal is ultimately, if you went with this, you'll, you'd be on one AED. So you're keeping monotherapy as the option, just switching the agent. Uh, the other thing you could do is, let's say you're getting some reduction in seizures, but still some seizure activity, you're going to add another AED, usually from this above pool. And you can combine all of them if you wanted to. So they all can work together. Uh, I think, you know, mechanistically, it makes sense for Keppra to be part of the regimen just because it's, it's slightly different in how it works in the neuron. But... Again, they're all combined. There's evidence for using all of them together, so you don't really have to follow that recommendation. But from a pharmacologic standpoint, it makes a little bit more sense to, if you don't have that as a starting agent, to add that as your second choice or to add something else onto it because you're going to get some hopeful synergy out of that. Uh, and then two to four years seizure-free. Basically, if you can get, if you're struggling in this area, you're probably just going to add agents until some cocktail works. Hopefully two or three agents will do the trick for the majority of patients out there. But remember, it could be like up to a third of patients that just don't fully respond, and that, that can be challenging, of course. But that would be more of a, let's refer them to somebody who can maybe manage this a little bit differently. Um, two to four years of seizure-free. Consider stopping the AED, slowly taper it off. So you can stop anti-epileptic drugs if you want to. Um, the question is, you know, who, which, which patient populations, and that's definitely a, an individual circumstance type thing. How serious were the seizures? How hard was it to, to get them controlled? I had a professor in pharmacy school who uh, started lamotrigine, and he was he had a couple unprovoked seizures uh, in his like 60s, and he started lamotrigine, got controlled, and he stopped it. Um, after taking it for a few years, tapered off of it, and then he, he actually had some recurrent, and so now he's just took it for life, basically, after that. All right, so anyway, um, risk versus benefit in that situation. A lot of patients will be on them for life. That's not uncommon, but you could certainly could if somebody wanted to try getting off of one, uh, maybe see. Especially if, like, a patient was maybe started on them as a child, took them through childhood, maybe wants to get pregnant at some point in her life. Uh, doesn't want to risk any fetal exposure, and they haven't had any issues, maybe it would be worth tapering. But at the same time, um, exposing a, a fetus to a seizure is detrimental, potentially. So, again, big risk-benefit things to talk about. So just something to think about. Uh, partial is very similar. Um, again, broad-spectrum agents can be used for generalized or partial. It's just partial-only agents can't be used for generalized. That's the big difference between why I separated them out like that. So really, your same drugs are the same. Uh, your two, or sorry, your first two choices are the same here, and you're going to cross taper or add appropriately. Consider partial only adjuncts would be the only real difference here. Is you could give it to some of that pool, like Vimpat or uh, some of those other drugs on that slide could come into play in this category. Same thing for uh, if you're seizure free once you get them controlled. Yes. Isn't Vimpat only IV still No, sorry, I probably said that wrong. It's PO and IV. Yeah, it does have an IV formulation available. It comes, yeah, it comes orally. So the four drugs, I think, that are IV are levetiracetam or Keppra, uh, valproic acid, phenytoin, and lecosamide or Vimpat are the four. All right. Um, I don't really, I'm not going to spend any time on this treatment plan because it's just really rare to see somebody with absence seizures. And there's really only a, this weird 
drug called ethosuximide that's used for pediatric patients with it, and it's the only thing it's ever used for. So that's why I put this on here. Otherwise, you treat it basically the same way. The only thing you don't do is not use these drugs. <laughs> so in case you're wondering, there are certain seizure subtypes where some drugs are proven to actually exacerbate the condition, so we don't use them. Uh, again, I'm not going to test you on Epson seizures. All right, just to review special populations, we talked a lot about pregnancy today because it does tend to come up a lot in this patient population. Again, having a seizure during pregnancy is a lot thought to be much higher risk than taking a, an anti-epileptic drug to control seizures. So almost always the benefit of the AED is going to outweigh seizures. Even, this is, this is kind of controversial, but even if somebody, let's say you had a person on valproic acid, which we said was contraindicated in pregnancy, right? Um, the idea of stopping that might actually cause more harm than good uh, if you think about it as as far as how controlled is the patient, how many seizures did they have before, did it take a lot of time to get that person controlled, are they on multiple agents, those are things to consider. Now if that person's on that drug and they can't really go without it, it might be an ethical question to say, you know, just let them know of the risks behind what could happen if they did get pregnant and the, the high teratogenicity, relatively high teratogenicity effects that come with that drug, but certainly a conversation to have, not an easy one, but something to think about. Um, the most of the evidence right now, again, we don't. Uh, we're going to talk about pregnancy, and I'll, I'll mention briefly some of the studies around medications and pregnancies. But the gist of it is that there's not a lot of solid data for using medications in pregnant women. As you could imagine, it's unethical to study developing fetuses in pregnant women and to see their effects. So a lot of times, it's situations like this where the person is on an anti-epileptic epileptic drug, they keep it going through their pregnancy because it's essential. They don't want to risk the seizure. And then ultimately, they end up uh, getting studied retrospectively. So in places like um, the UK and Denmark, where it's more socialized medicine, you can pull giant chunks of data and look at all this stuff. So that's where a lot of the studies will come out of that you'll read um, if you do look into this more often, if you're curious. But uh, they'll look at you know hundreds of thousands of pregnant women who took AEDs and what the outcomes of their child were. And they can pull that kind of data and they'll decide, OK, what's better, what's worse. That's where a lot of this comes from. So. First choice, lamotrigine and levetiracetam are thought to be the safest in pregnancy. Uh, your second choice, kind of middle of the road, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, and zanisamide are thought to be okay if you need to use them, even though carbamazepine is category D. We'll talk about pregnancy categories and why they're kind of, they don't matter as much as you might think they do. Uh, third choice, phenytoin, phenobarbital, topiramate. Fourth choice, which I didn't even list, would be valproic acid. So you don't, um, kind of in order of what's going to potentially cause the most birth defects. For most studies, actually, they show if you're on like a first or second choice agent, there's virtually no increased risk of having birth defects all above the general population. So it's a pretty solid amount of evidence out there that says these are relatively safe to take in pregnancy. Again, with those few exceptions. Um, all right, children, uh, pretty much all these drugs are useful in pediatric patients. There's virtually no contraindication. The dosing kinetics are going to change. The formulations are probably going to be more suspension oriented and things like that. Uh, but a lot of them come like that. So like Keppra comes as an oral liquid, in case you're curious. So a lot of them um, have those things already available. Uh, Lenox Gestout is a severe childhood seizure with neurodevelopmental issues. There's not really any drugs that work great, but there are a couple that have thought to be maybe some better choices. And carbamazepine tends to exacerbate that one as well. Very rare. If you work in peds, you might see it. Uh, I just wanted to bring this up, the brand versus generic thing. This comes up occasionally, and anti-epileptic drugs seem to be, I don't know, an occasional target of this argument. So the idea is, is that you know, you've got variants between brands, potentially. So let's say your brand name Keppra is 95% levetiracetam of what it says. So let's say it's 1,000 milligrams of Keppra. When you take that drug, you're getting 950 milligrams of Keppra, right? That's within the realm of possibility. Um, so let's say you switch to a generic company and it's 105% um, uh, Keppra. So then you take that product and you're getting 1,050 milligrams of Keppra. So you've got a 100 milligram difference there. Uh, does that make a difference in somebody's day-to-day -day regimen? That's a good question. I don't think so. I don't think the studies have supported that. However, you will see somebody, some people and some providers that believe that they need to prescribe the brand name only and it's not worth switching. That's their choice. Again, I don't think the evidence supports that. Certainly, if you had a difficult patient to control, you might consider that. But um, most generic companies are going to be much tighter than this 80 to 125 percent range. They're probably going to be much closer to like 95 to that 105 window. So you shouldn't have a huge variability between one manufacturer to another. But it is possible. 
Where I'd say it's more of an issue is possibly drugs like phenytoin, where they're neurotherapeutic index. With Keppra, it's probably a bad example because does that amount make any difference? Probably not. It's got a really wide therapeutic index. Phenytoin, uh, valproic acid even, which has a little bit of a narrow therapeutic index compared to like Keppra and Lamotrigine, certainly could be an issue in some patients. So I just want to bring that up because it does come up from time to time. There's actually some legislation proposed in a Minnesota state senate. Um, I can't remember if it was the state senator or the state house, doesn't matter. But it came up a few years ago where they, they wanted to ban auto substitution of generic anti epileptic drugs. It did go through. Uh, but in case you don't know, I think we've talked about this before, but if you prescribe something brand name and you don't put DAW on it, right, pharmacies can automatically substitute generic. Uh, that would go for these drugs too. So they're trying to change that for Minnesota. It didn't go through. But, so sometimes stuff like that comes up. All right. And then just finally, um, agents reported to induce seizures in case we want to talk about the other side of the coin when it comes to medications, what is more commonly thought to maybe induce a seizure in a patient. I think this stuff's kind of interesting. Um, some of the things I point out, uh, we talked about uh, like beta-lactam antibiotics in really high amounts, and especially in your renal failure patients, if they accumulate, that's one of the, the only side effects I can think of with those medications, why, why we monitor them and why we actually care. If you're like, does anybody ever get hurt if they take too much amoxicillin? Well, actually, yeah, you technically could. Um, antidepressants, uh, we won't, I'll probably mention this one again, but these are all pretty odd ones, with the exception of bupropion, which is Wellbutrin, and that one can lower seizure threshold. If you have people who are um, epileptics, it's a really bad choice to give them, uh, but otherwise a super popular antidepressant. Um, some other stuff I don't really care about. Uh, Alcohol withdrawal, uh, benzodiazepine withdrawal, that's the big risk there is seizures. Uh, so we'll talk about that during a separate module, but just in case. So there's a nice little side, slide here. I'm not going to test you on any of these things, so don't worry about it. We'll talk about some of the psych meds uh, when we come into that uh, next module. All right, let's just take a quick break. Uh, we'll take five minutes to come back at 435. If you guys want to think about any questions you want to ask for the exam, we'll have plenty of time.